Well, good evening and welcome to everybody. Uh, I am indeed Frances Hellman. I'm Dean of Mathematical and Physical Sciences in the College of Letters and Sciences at UC Berkeley. And I'm also a professor of physics and well, a, 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 an astronomy groupie. And so um, it's a great pleasure to be participating in this series. I'm obviously, as all of you, not happy that we're continuing to have to do everything by Zoom, but I am very grateful that we have this way to connect with you, our alumni and friends. Um, last fall, Mike Bochin, who is the Dean of, of, the bio, of Biological Sciences, and I partnered to launch this series, called, which we titled Basic Science Lights the Way, and it's proven to be a great way to share our science with folks all over the world. Um, Mike and I are happy to see that there's an appetite for science and facts, and tonight we're going to talk to you about a topic that is particularly important on the Berkeley campus. You may have heard that we've created a division, a new division of data science, and as well as through campuses throughout the country, extremely relevant in all of our lives, um, data science. I like to simplify the discussion around data science into two parts. There is the science of data science itself, and then there is the use of data science in scientific inquiry. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the latter. In other words, how is data science advancing fields found in the biological and physical sciences? And Berkeley is really the perfect place for this discussion. We are home to great scientists in fields including astrophysics, particle physics, geology, neuroscience, genomics, to name just a few. And we're home to the leaders, to many of the really outstanding leaders in data science, machine learning, AI, et cetera. In some cases, some of our faculty are actually leaders in both areas. And together we are educating the next generation of biologists, physicists, geologists, astronomers, and data scientists. So this evening, we are gonna hear from four fantastic scientists who are pushing the boundaries in their fields by utilizing new theories and models to handle data. Um, our moderator this evening is Josh Bloom, who is professor and chair of the Department of Astronomy. And Josh really is the perfect example of someone who embraced data science in the service of his field of research, high energy astrophysics, specifically time domain transient events and gamma ray bursts. In his embrace of data science, he pioneered Python boot camps for students, a graduate level class on Python, and even founded his own artificial intelligence applications startup called wise.io. Josh has been awarded the data-driven discovery prize from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and the Pierce Prize from the American Astronomical Society. He's also a former Sloan Fellow, a junior fellow at the Harvard Society and a Hertz Foundation Fellow. And he's a great pleasure, um, one of the great, uh, pe great people that I really enjoy working with on the Berkeley campus. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Josh. Take, Josh, take it away. Thank you, Francis. It's such a pleasure for me to be here and play a role in today's events. And thank you all for coming. I'm excited about the work of my colleagues and the boundaries that they are pushing. The computer scientist, Jim Gray, who is a Turing Award winner and a Cal alum said more than two decades ago, I love working with astronomers since their data is useless. And I love this quote as an astronomer, as an astronomer because he realized very early on that while the questions we ask of our massive data sets are fascinating and important, there's no danger in working with our data uh, in leaking information, PII, or leaking sensitive bank info or starting wars. Astronomy data would be a great and safe sandbox for him and his colleagues to test new database architectures, algorithmic methods, and computational approaches. But us domain scientists have also learned how to pull in those methodologies, not having them pushed towards us, um, that have been developed elsewhere uh, for other you know, industry-specific purposes. And we're using those to push the knowledge envelope of our own respective fields. In doing so, increasingly, I'm seeing that it is the peculiarities of our data and the unique ways in which we ask questions of that data that we're really leading to new innovations in methods and computational approaches themselves. As Francis said, tonight we are going to offer a small sampling of how Berkeley scientists are leveraging advances in machine learning and artificial intelligence to open vast new paths and improve our understanding of the world and the universe around us. And it's really true that Berkeley is a leader in this field. We are educating more undergraduates than any other university in the world in data science. There's now a data science major and a minor here on campus. 
And we are connecting that knowledge to important areas of study for our students and faculty. I'm extremely excited to share some basic science stories with you and demonstrate the role that data science has played in these lines of inquiry. As you can imagine, we're really only scratching the surface. I'll now ask Professor Rasmuth Nielsen and Professor Priya Morjani and graduate student Eliana Abrams to tell us about their current research projects. At the end, we'll try to address some of the questions from you, the audience, that you put in the chat. So please, please, please put your questions in there. We'll be monitoring that throughout. Let me first start off with Professor Morjani. Priya Morjani is an assistant professor of human evolutionary genetics in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology and the Center for Computational Biology. Her research and lab focuses on statistical and computational approaches to study questions in human genetics and evolutionary biology, in addition to both the development of new methods and large-scale genomic data analysis. A central aim of her lab is to understand the impact of evolutionary history on genetic variation and to apply this knowledge to understand human evolution, demographic history, and disease. Importantly, her research and lab aims to leverage these patterns to identify genetic variants related to human adaptation and disease. Priya, can you tell us a bit about your research and the projects you're currently working on? Hi, Josh. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you all for uh, joining us by Zoom today. Uh, as Josh mentioned, my lab is interested in studying human evolution. And uh, as a computational biologist, we use uh, genetic data from, that is present in uh, all of the cells of our uh, body. Uh, now uh, technology has advanced so much that we can study the entire genome of an individual. You can sequence all 6.4 uh, billion base pairs of an individual, and this can be done for as little as $1,000. Uh, and uh, the costs are uh, falling uh, very quickly. And what this has allowed us to do is that uh, it has really led to this has uh, really led to a big uh, explosion of data in uh, biology. Just to give you a sense of the scale of the data, in my lab, it's quite routine for us to analyze data from 2,500 individuals from diverse human populations that belong to the Thousand Genomes Project. Uh, to study uh, the relationship of genes and traits by looking at the UK Biobank, which has 500,000 individuals, or to study our entire coding variation by looking at data from 150,000 individuals that are part of uh, the NOMAD uh, project. And all of these studies do off in comparison to NIH's plans of sequencing more than a million people. And these kinds of data are really uh, changing the way we think about human history uh, and uh, health. Another major advance in our field has been of uh, sequencing ancient DNA samples. This is, uh, basic, uh, this is because we can now extract DNA from uh, ancient bones or fossils. And by working in clean rooms and sterile conditions, we can uh, extract DNA of our past ancestors. Using sequencing, then we can uh, study how these people who lived in the past relate to, uh, relate to all of us. And this technique, which was pioneered right here at UC Berkeley in, by Alan Wilson, is really uh, changing the way we think about our evolution. It has allowed us to sequence the genome of Neanderthals and study how Neanderthals relate to uh, all of us. Uh, it has even led to the discovery of a new hominin uh, species or group, Denisovans. I'll show you in a few slides how these, uh, this group is, uh, really had a major impact on our genetic variation. And now more than 5,000 ancient genomes have been sequenced. And this kind of data is allowing us to uh, time travel. It's allowing us to see how uh, we are evolving and change, uh, changing. And from these data, we have really learned a lot. We, by analyzing data from present day and ancient DNA sample, uh, samples, we can tell that modern humans arose in Africa about 200 to uh, 400,000 years ago. Then about 50,000 years ago, uh, a, a group of them left Africa and populated the rest of the world, going to uh, Europe and as far as Australia and about uh, 
15, 000, uh, 15 to 20,000 years ago, uh, they settled, uh, modern humans uh, settled uh, the Americas. But uh, in this journey, they were not alone. When they uh, left Africa, they interacted with Neanderthals who had been living in uh, Europe and Asia for 400,000 years. And when these groups uh, met with each other, uh, they uh, mixed with each other. And today, all of, not, all of us non-Africans have about one to 3% Neanderthal ancestry in our genomes. They also uh, met with this group Denisovans that I mentioned. And today, many of us have between 0.1 to 5% of Denisovan ancestry. That might seem small, but if you have 6 billion uh, sites in the genome, that's a, a lot of information that can be used to, uh, and that group uh, can impact our genetic variation uh, uh, substantially. Now, how do we go from base pairs to history? So uh, here's just a cartoon example where I'm showing you data for four different uh, groups. Uh, in our lab, we actually use millions of such sites. Here, I'm showing you data for eight different uh, sites. And when we want to study how different groups relate to each other, we apply clustering uh, methods. And these uh, methods uh, help us see uh, immediately that um, Neanderthals are most different from uh, Africans and uh, non-Africans. You can also look at the sequences here. And even from the sequences, you can tell that the largest differences are between Neanderthals and modern humans. Next, we see that there are more uh, differences between uh, Africans and non-Africans. And this is because of the out of Africa uh, migration. We can also apply more complex methods like building uh, phylogenetic trees or graphs really, because uh, there are more similarities between human groups than there are differences. And uh, new machine learning techniques uh, that uh, have many of them that are being developed right here at Berkeley also allow us to do chromosome painting. This is just a fancy way of trying to tell where different blocks of our ancestor, uh, where different blocks of our ancestors are in our uh, genome. So here, if we wanted to look for uh, bits of Neanderthal uh, DNA within uh, non-Africans, we could uh, apply machine learning methods and uh, perform um, classification to show that, you know, the, this different bits are present in non-Africans from uh, Neanderthals. So let's color the genome of Neanderthals in blue. And here you can see this uh, region, AAT, actually uh, clusters much more with Neanderthals than with modern humans. And that's how we uh, can find bits of Neanderthal ancestry in our genome. And in my lab, we also want to use uh, DNA as a clock for trying to learn about when these different events happened. And so in one recent project, we wanted to try to learn about when did the Neanderthal and modern human mixture occur. And to do this, we used uh, our biology training. So as, men, uh, as uh, many of you know, during meiosis, uh, chromosomes get mixed up with each other. This is because crossovers occur that mix the DNA of uh, both of our parents. So if the two parents were of Neanderthal and modern human ancestry, what would happen is then we, the offspring would have mixed chromosomes such that there are blocks of Neanderthal ancestry in modern humans and blocks of modern human ancestry in the Neanderthal genomes. But every generation, uh, certain recombination events happen. And so these blocks become smaller and smaller. But we uh, can uh, measure the lengths of these blocks over uh, many, many generations later. And we can estimate when this uh, mixture happened. And by applying this, we were able to directly learn about the timing of human Neanderthal mixture just from genetic data. So here I'm showing you the result for two samples. One is the modern humans, where you have little bits of uh, Neanderthal DNA. And then you can also look at an ancient sample, which is a 45,000 year old Ustashim bone in this case, where uh, there are large blocks of Neanderthal ancestry. And using, uh, by measuring the lengths of these blocks, we were able to learn that the modern human Neanderthal mixture occurred between 40 to uh, 55,000 years before present. And this is really exciting because here we have only used genetic data, but we uh, reconstruct a time that actually is concordant with what we are learning from the fossil uh, evidence also. And uh, mo modern human and Neanderthal mixture is not a unique event in our history. All of us are mosaics of different ancestries. If you think of African-Americans, they have African and European ancestry. Think of Latino populations, they have Native American and European ancestry. And all South Asians have 
some ancestral South Indian ancestry that is just indigenous to the subcontinent, but they also have a North Indian, uh, ancestral North Indian an ancestry, uh, which is related to people who lived in West Eurasia, in Central Asia, and uh, in, um, uh, in uh, Iran and uh, steppe populations. And we can again apply those methods uh, that I showed you for dating Neanderthal mixture and learn about the timing of these mixtures. And this uh, helps us reconstruct the timing of historical events, such as uh, the European colonization of Americas, but it also helps us understand things that are beyond written records. So looking at how different technologies like the development of agriculture and um, uh, spread of languages has impacted our genetic variation. So in South Asia, we can tell that these mixtures occurred between 3,500 to 7,500 years ago, and that has really changed the genetic makeup of the people living there today. And this can also help us learn about uh, uh, human uh, health and diseases. In this case, because um, um, because popu mosaic populations or admixed populations have ancestry from multiple groups, if uh, we can use ancestry for helping us uh, pinpoint where in the genome the disease variants are hiding. This is because imagine if a group has ancestry from, uh, from this uh, blue group as well as this pink group, uh, what happens is if you get the disease based on the uh, blue ancestors, then uh, at the disease locus, there is a much more uh, a higher prevalence of the blue ancestry in the cases compared to the pink ancestry. Now we can go in and apply our machine learning methods for doing chromosome painting and identify regions where we see an increase in the blue ancestry in the genome. This way, out of the uh, 6.4 uh, billion uh, variants in the uh, genome, we can go and identify where the disease variants are hi uh, hiding. And this the kinds of techniques are really helping us extend disease mapping to more diverse populations. With that, I just want to thank my group who have made these kinds of studies uh, possible. Uh, and uh, thank you all for tuning in. I'm happy to answer a few questions. Well, thank you, Priya. That was uh, really wonderful. Uh, we've got a question in the chat, and I think there's probably some more coming. I also had a bunch of questions as well. Um, the first question in the chat is, how far back was the modern Neanderthal first admixture? So the first admixture we think was about uh, 40 to 50,000 uh, years ago. So the uh, dating that we did uh, helped us look as, at present day as well as ancient DNA samples. And from the ancient DNA samples, we can tell uh, precisely where the Neanderthal ancestry uh, comes in and how it changes over time. And how much of the Neanderthal DNA is expressed today? I, I understood that some large fraction of our DNA doesn't really get expressed what fraction of the of the DNA that is a Neanderthal is actually expressed today? Yeah. So what we find is that um, there is uh, almost all non-Africans have between one to three percent Neanderthal ancestry, but there is a reduction in Neanderthal ancestry near the uh, coding regions, and this is because um, Neanderthals actually had a very small population size, and so they had uh, mutations that were actually uh, sometimes uh, deleterious or had negative impacts. And so those mutations have been removed from our genome. So there is a little reduction near the, uh, in the coding regions, uh, but uh, there are also many uh, regions which have Neanderthal ancestry that have been very beneficial for us. Great, so sort of turning to the data science side, um, can you just say a bit about where your data comes from and um, as, as the question in the chat, what types of tools are you using to make these discoveries? You've talked about the role of machine learning, but maybe you could kind of double click for us on that. Yeah, so a lot of our data comes uh, from uh, public sources. So for instance, the Thousand Genomes Project is a publicly available data set for everybody to use. Uh, lots of them comes from uh, data that has been collected by other studies, but is available to scientists through uh, uh, through uh, through a database that NIH has put together. That's called the dbGaP. Uh, we also use a lot of ancient DNA samples um, that uh, are also mostly publicly available. Uh, and in terms of data analysis techniques, we are using uh, many clustering methods like principal components analysis, multiple uh, dimensionality reduction methods. 
uh, and also uh, using machine learning uh, techniques like support vector machines or random forest. And these help us uh, really um, classify uh, different uh, ancestries uh, as well as study the relationship of different groups. Thanks. I mean, one of the things that we think about when we think about data science broadly on campus here isn't just methods and computation, but other dimensions of data science. And one of these great questions that showed up in the chat uh, touches on this around the ethics of, of this work. And the question uh, from Brian is, is it ethical to extract DNA from human remains without the consent from early humans? So um, I think, um, so in many cases, there is uh, a lot of effort being put by scientists to get ethical, uh, uh, to ensure that this data is collected and used in an ethical way. We often try to get consents from uh, different communities to ensure that uh, we can use this data. Uh, some of this data comes from museums, uh, and there is extensive care done to ensure that you use the most minute amount of the sample so that you don't destroy a unique uh, bone from the past. Um, and um, in, there is a lot of efforts to also do community engagement. Um, and so I, I would say that uh, it's very important for us to um, try to um, engage the communities and to do this work in a very ethical manner. Uh, and yet, and also this is a very powerful uh, kind of data that can help us all learn about our past. So there's always a, um, we're always trying to make sure that both of those are uh, being met. Great, thank you. There's a lot of other questions that are showing up in the chat here, um, but we'll hopefully get to a few of those maybe towards the end. Uh, just in the interest of time, I think we uh, need to move on. Thank you very much, Priya. Um, our next speaker is Rasmus Nielsen, who is a professor of integrative biology and statistics. His current research concerns statistical analysis of next generation sequencing data, both in the context of medical genetics and population genetics. Many of the methods he has developed are heavily used by other researchers. He's also developed a number of computational methods and applied them to large scale genomic data and also worked on understanding human genetic variation. He uses both the classical statistical methods and evolutionary inferences to identify genetic variants that affect phylotypical uh, variability, including genetic adaptations, the diet and local environmental factors. He has studied the genetic basis of human adaptation to high altitude, changes in diet and cold climates. He's also worked extensively on analyses of ancient DNA derived from fossils to understand human origins and diversification. Rasmus, can you tell us a bit about your research and the projects that you're working on? I'd be very happy to. Thank you so much for uh, the introduction. And uh, I'll have to say I also really enjoyed Priya's uh, presentation. We do very um, similar and related research, and it's always great to uh, hear from her. Uh, the, she does uh, some very exciting research. So she, she talked a little bit about this revolution that's been in the biological sciences, particularly in our area, from the, our new ability to sequence genomes, and not just for one individual, but for thousands of individuals. And all the amazing things we can do with those data, particularly for learning more about ourselves and our past history. So Priya talked a bit about how uh, we can use the data to figure out how people of humans spread around the world and add mix with groups such as uh, the Neanderthals and this other group, the Denisovans. One of the things I've been interested in is, well, what happened to us as we came into the new environments? How have we adapted to these new environments? No matter where you go in the world, you'll find humans that have been there for thousands of years. And of course, it's very much because of technical innovations. We have been so good at conquering these new environments. But these environments might also have affected us biologically. We might have been adapting to these environments. So one of the things I'm interested in is trying to learn from genomic data, from all this vast amount of genomic data, how might we have been adapting to these uh, new environments. And the key to that is to try to figure out where in the genome do we find the footprints of natural selection. So you can imagine you have a mutation at some point that provides a benefit to the individuals who carry that mutation. Then the mutation will increase in frequency in the population. And our job is to find from modern day, and sometimes also ancient day, day data, but mostly modern day data, modern day genomes, footprints 
where there's a signal of a mutation that has increased in frequency. So this is an example here. This is a mutation that causes lactase persistence in Europeans. That means that you can digest milk as an adult. You don't have lactose intolerance. And uh, we make inferences of the, the frequency of the, this mutation through time. You can see within the last 5,000 years here, it has increased from a percentage of maybe 15% to about 70% in some European populations. That is the signal of natural selection. Now, we can't see this path directly. We have to infer it indirectly from the genomic data that we have. So what the way we do that is we develop stochastic models of how these mutations change their frequency through time. So we can write down stochastic differential equations that describes these paths. And then when we have that, then we can ask the question, what is the pattern, the specific pattern that you will see in the data, given there's been a change in frequency from that? And now then we have to do the reverse inference. We have to take our genomic sequences, and then we have to figure out where in the genomic sequences does our model tell us that we have patterns in the data that fits a strong increase in frequency of the mutation, so strong that it must have been natural selection. And we can, in fact, from, from modern day data, estimate when selection might have happened and also how strong selection has been, how much of a fitness difference there's been between people that had the mutation and didn't have the mutation. So that's a little bit about what we're doing. Most of the time, we spend in front of the computer developing methods for doing that. But I'd like to talk about some of the applications of that that we have been doing. One of them is, as Josh mentioned in his introduction, altitude adaptation. We've been very interested in particularly forbidden altitude adaptation, but also uh, some other populations. So what happens in high altitude? If you are I, I or most other people who are not high altitude adapted, we go up in high altitude, we'll suffer from oxygen deprivation. For example, the Tibetan Plateau, it is at, at an altitude of four kilometers. And that means with each breath of air, you only get 60% as much oxygen as you would get at sea level. So it will suffer from oxygen deprivation. As a response to that, our body starts to produce more red blood cells. That's a good thing because now we can better transport all the oxygen uh, in our blood. Okay, because it's the red blood cells that bind the oxygen in our blood. But there's also a negative effect of it. This it changes the viscosity of the blood. The blood becomes thicker instead of having nice, clean flowing blood. We have now thick yogurt-like blood in our veins, and that's not so good because it predisposes people who have that to a number of diseases, particularly increases the chance of stroke. So there's a negative fitness effect of this natural response to produce too many red blood cells. Now, the interesting thing is, and that's something anthropologists have shown a long time ago, is that Tibetans don't do that. They somehow manage the high altitude without producing too many red blood cells. And what we did then was we took these methods that I talked about before for, to find out where this natural selection in the genome of specifically the Tibetans and that led us to one particular gene. Now, actually, a couple of different genes and more, but one with a very, very strong effect, which is called EPAS1. And the function of that gene is to regulate red blood cell production. And we could then show this is actually the gene that's largely responsible for the difference between Tibetans and other populations in how they regulate uh, red blood cell production. Now, then we do what we like to do. We like to model how this increase in frequency happened, when it happened, how strong this selection was, and so on. So we modeled, did more work on trying to model this to try to figure, answer some of these questions about is selection only in Tibet and how strong this selection was, and so on. But when we did that, none of our models fit. Of course, when we develop models, we try to see if they fit the data well, and they didn't. And let me explain to you what the problem was that we had. It's illustrated by this figure here. We compared people in Tibet to Han Chinese uh, people, uh, the major ethnic group in China. And in the EPAS1 gene, the DNA sequences we got for the Tibetans were very different from the Chinese, the Han Chinese sequences, actually much more different than our models predicted. We couldn't come up with good models that will the just a process of natural selection would create this, these many genetic differences between the populations in this gene. It was too extreme, we couldn't model it. So we thought maybe it's the Neanderthal sequence. Maybe it's one of these segments that Priya talked about that got into uh, the Tibetans, but it wasn't. But it turned out it was in fact a Denisovan sequence. When we look, looked at a Denisovan sequence and compared it, there was almost a per perfect match to the Tibetan sequence. And we could show that this could only happen in one way, 
we could exclude other possibilities. It could only happen if there's been interbreeding between the ancestors of Tibetans and these Denisovans. Who are these Denisovans? These are distant, distant cousins of the Neanderthals that we more or less only know from a few bone fragments and then that genomic sequence that we got now of the bone fragment. But they are also one of the reasons why Tibetans have been able to function so well in high altitude because the Tibetans ancestors interbred with these other, these other human species that was already there and that we could pick up genes that were beneficial for them that would allow them to survive better in high altitude. Okay, so this is the Tibetans. I'll give one more example of a population we worked on. These Bajau sea nomads from Indonesia, they also lived uh, other places, uh, Malaysia, few, uh, Philippines, but uh, the people we studied uh, are from Indonesia. We're interested in that because they live a very, very extreme lifestyle. They live as sea nomads on coral reefs. So that means they live on boats and they sail around and then they get all the nutrition in the traditional lifestyle from uh, diving underwater and fishing fish and invertebrates. And it turns out, in fact, that anthropologists that have followed them around says that they spent 60% on that of their daily working time underwater. Okay, so they are holding their breath 60% of the time when they're active. So that's an extreme pressure they're putting on their own physiology, very different from other populations. They time and time again, or the entire lifespan, expose themselves to acute hypoxia, acute oxygen deprivation. And we're interested in, has that imposed any kind of natural selection on their bodies? The question is, what should you look at if you look for trying to find the effects of natural selection? What are the things you should measure for them? And we're interested in something called the diving reflex. Okay, so the diamond reflex is something you find in all mammals. And it's a, a reflex that is initiated by holding your breath and then getting your face underwater. So you might be familiar with the feeling of, you know, a warm summer day, you jump into a cold lake and you feel really, really refreshed by that. That's not just psychology. There's actually physiology behind that because this diamond reflex, what that does when you dive into the lake is that it's a... Uh, it lowers your heart rate and it also sets your blood cells, your more blood into your central organs. And it does one other thing it contracts the spleen. Now, why would it contract the spleen? Well, the spleen stores blood cells, including red blood cells. And when it contracts, it injects oxygenated red blood cells into your bloodstream. So it's like you have a diving tank with you when you jump into the water. And as soon as you get into the cold water, Spleen will contract and you have more red uh, oxygenated blood cells. So you can better, uh, you can die for a longer time and you can die better uh, with this. So what people have seen is in some marine, marine mammals such as seals, they have a grossly enlarged spleen. So for example, some elephant seals, their spleen can weigh more than hundred kilograms, 200 pounds. So they have massive spleens and it's thought to be an adaptation for animals that are land living to be able to dive and possibly also dive deep. So what we're interested in, could we see if the Bajau had something similar going on with the spleen and could we find a genetic basis of that? And so a graduate student, Melissa Lado, she lived down with the Bajau and worked in that community uh, for a while. And then she measures spleen sizes. So you can do that with an ultrasound, which is what you see here. There's Melissa sitting in a, in a village in Indonesia measuring spleens using ultrasound. And she also from sp got spit samples where she could then uh, later sequence the genomes of the study participants from those spit samples. And what she was able to show is that they in fact have enlarged spleens compared to other populations. And she could pinpoint using these methods that first finds natural selection, that in fact, this there's a particular variant in a gene called PDE10A that's been under very strong selection in these Bajau people and is causing the large spleen size. So it seems like there's a genetic basis for this and these Bajau people, similar to what seals have been doing, have been adapting to a diving lifestyle by having an enlarged spleen. Okay, so I'll start I'll end, uh, with that. I'd like to thank all of these study participants that participated in these different studies. And of course, all my collaborators, these are big collaborative studies that involve many people. And particularly I'd like to thank some of the young people that worked on these projects, particularly Emilio Huerta Sanchez, who drove much of the research on the Tibetans. Um, and also Emilisa Elado, who did all of the work 
for uh, the Bajau study. And uh, thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Rasmus. That was, that was wonderful. Um, I think just in the interest of time, we'll get to some of the great questions that showed up in the chat uh, during your talk um, at the end of uh, this last presentation that we have for you. Um, the next speaker is Eliana um, Abrams. She is an NSF graduate research fellow and a Two Sigma fellow in the astronomy and the statistics department. Before coming to Berkeley, she was a Helen Fellow in Computational Science at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Currently, she builds and implements physics-informed machine learning architectures to study the time domain properties of new and rare variable systems. She works with me, as well as statistics professor Fernando Perez, who's on the call with us today, on an array of projects. Eliana, can you tell us a bit about your research and the projects you're currently working on? Sure, thank you so much for the introduction, Josh. And uh, as I pull up my slides, I just wanna say thank you so much to the committee for having me here and to the audience for coming to attend our talks. And I'd like to compliment the speakers before me. Those were wonderful presentations and it was really exciting to hear about that research. Uh, we're going to switch gears right now. As Josh mentioned, I'm a graduate student in the astrophysics and statistics departments where I work with Josh and Fernando Perez. And today I'm going to talk to you specifically about a particular use case for data science in astronomy. Uh, my work focuses on objects that vary over time. And I'm gonna talk about how we recently used data science to find some of the rarest binary systems in the Milky Way. Before I dive into that, I'm just going to define what data science in astronomy means. And we'll start by talking about the data. Everything we know in astrophysics, everything we know about stars, about galaxies, about binary systems, we learn from their light. These objects are located so far from Earth that we're unable to send probes to understand them. And so instead we turn our best tools, our telescopes, and collect the light that comes from these objects that's traveled over vast distances. And so data science in astronomy is just the process of extracting physics knowledge from this collected starlight. As an example, the image in the back of this slide here is a real photo. It is not an artist's rendition. It was taken by the Gaia Space Telescope. And you can see that it has extreme detail. Every point of light that you see on this image is a star, a system, possibly a dwarf galaxy orbiting the Milky Way. And we can see gas clouds in the Milky Way. We can see colors, which tell us something about the underlying physics of the regions and the stars that we're looking at. We can even see the large and small Magellanic clouds in great detail. And Gaia is a really exciting mission. Here, this one is an artist's rendition, but this is a rendition of the Gaia Space Telescope, which is in co-orbit around the sun with Earth. And Gaia provides a static three-dimensional map to about two billion Milky Way stars. What do I mean by a three-dimensional map? Gaia measures brightnesses, distances, and motions of nearly two billion stars. This is really exciting because prior to this, the largest study that we had, Hipparchos from the 90s, only measured millions of stars, these same measurements for millions of stars. And Gaia can see much deeper and much fainter than Hipparchos could. This means that we have access to stars that are further than what Hipparchos could see, and also stars that are fainter. So we're able to look at the edge cases. In other words, the more rare and the less understood objects. In particular, for the study that I'm going to talk about, we focused on a type of binary system called cataclysmic variables, commonly called CVs. And CVs are composed of a white dwarf, white dwarf primary member, a low mass star secondary member, and the low mass star donates mass to an accretion disk that is in orbit around the white dwarf primary. Typically, we identify these systems by the variations in their brightness over time. I look at short period cataclysmic variables. These are binary systems with an orbital period of less than two hours. That makes them very compact. In fact, these low, uh, these short period cataclysmic variables fit entirely. That's the white dwarf with its accretion disk and the low mass star within the radius of Jupiter. So you can imagine that not only are they very exotic, but they're also extremely chaotic. And so this, this kind of chaos in the system shows up as variations in their brightness, and that's how we're typically able to find them around the galaxy. However, oh, 
and that's the accretion disk. However, short period CVs composed of these three different components are intrinsically faint. All three of these things are faint, and so typically they're challenging to find. Prior to Gaia, we only knew of thousands of short period CVs. And you can imagine that makes Gaia a really interesting mission with which to hopefully find more of these objects, especially as the physics predicts that we should find many more than we have so far. However, there's one caveat with the Gaia mission. Gaia does not provide images. Instead, it provides a static catalog of these measurements of brightness, distance, and motion. And so with that, we need to figure out some way, and this is our challenge, to see if we can find these rare binary systems, typically found by their time variations buried in billions of static measurements. And so how might we do this? Well, we need to understand how is Gaia collecting this data in the first place? Essentially, you can think of Gaia as an extremely powerful camera that's trained on the sky and takes images repeatedly over time. And so if Gaia is taking these images over time, why have we lost that time resolution? Why is Gaia only reporting all these static measurements? To understand that, we'd like to understand how is it that an image is composed in the first place? And so an image is just a composition of the true scene, in our case in astrophysics, and particularly Milky Way physics, the true Milky Way that is then convolved with the telescope diffraction of the system. So as light passes through the aperture of the telescope, it's diffracted, and this will blur and spread out the light that is received at the camera. But there are also other sources of noise that are just due to the fact that we have an electric telescope, the quantum nature of both electrons and the photons that are arriving at the telescope. And so in the end, we have an observed image. Well, we can't get rid of the telescope diffraction. That's just inherent to the nature of using cameras on the sky. We can model that out largely. And so our goal is to mitigate these sources of noise. And how do we do that? Well, we take many measurements over time. And if we make the assumption that the underlying star is stable, then we can assume that any variation in our measurement of brightness over time is just due to that noise. And so we can take the average over all these measurements over time and a standard deviation across all the measurements. And this gives us both a measure of the brightness and uncertainty. And that is what is reported by Gaia, not the full time time resolved set of observations, but instead just a brightness and uncertainty. But what about when we're looking at stars like cataclysmic variables? I mentioned that they vary over time. Clearly this is going to affect our measured uncertainty. And it turns out that it does. This widens the standard deviation that we take across the distribution of observations and provides a larger uncertainty on stars and systems that are inherently varying astrophysically. And so this is a novel method to use just these two statistics, the brightness or the mean across time and the uncertainty or the standard deviation across time. And so we can back out that the amplitude of astrophysical variation is proportional to just the ratio of that uncertainty over the measured brightness. If we fold this in to a uh, a system of inputs where we call that uh, methodology that I just showed you a variability metric and develop other metrics to make sure that our signal is picking up an astrophysical variation and not inherent telescope noise and combine this with observable covariance, things like the physics of the star itself, temperature and brightness. We can input these into something like a random forest regression, which is just a machine learning model that makes predictions. And we can use that to estimate the underlying time series itself. And so if we start with just these static measurements, just a brightness and uncertainty, we can index this entire static uh, catalog in just a few hours for time variable sources like cataclysmic variables with complete recovery. This opens the door then for the first nearly unbiased search for short period cataclysmic variables. Our only biases are the Gaia telescope itself. We're not biased about when we looked at the sky. We aren't biased on anything except just the limitations of Gaia. And this allowed us to nearly double the known population of short period CVs. This is exciting because this might be some of that missing population that I was talking about earlier. So in summary, we found thousands of these binary, of these binary systems 
hiding in the billions of Milky Way stars. And this is really exciting to be able to take billions of measurements and pinpoint these rare few thousands in a, in a really rapid and effective search. And the way that we did this was utilizing the noise in the system as the signal. Thank you so much for listening and I'd love to take your questions. Thank you, Eliana, that was wonderful. Um, we've got time for a few questions before we go into more general um, conversation. Uh, at some point you said you were using just a random forest model, which um, for those that know the history of uh, some of these amazing algorithms, uh, it was actually invented by a stats professor here. Um, maybe you could say a bit more about why random forest, why a specific choice of modeling technique and not some more of the, say, more traditional sort of linear models, et cetera? Uh, that's a great question. And I think to make it maybe an even more powerful question, why couldn't I just use the amplitude that I had measured initially? Sure. And so uh, the answer to this is, it lies in the fact that cataclysmic variables are chaotic. So there are many types of stars and systems that vary periodically over time. We can model those with sinusoids and sawtooth curves. And so those systems, the relationship between the amplitude of variation and that variability metric that we developed is very clear. And so we can find the coefficient that allows the proportionality to be an equality. But because cataclysmic variables are chaotic, they vary on a uh, stochastic scales. And so it's harder to model exactly that amplitude. And a random forest, because it's non-parametric, actually allows us to make uh, much sharper measurements of the underlying time series statistics. Um, excellent. So uh, kind of going from there, and then um, uh, I want to reference something that Amit asked in the chat. Um, what do we do once we found these really rare objects? So you, you got this fancy technique of, of indexing the, the sky, uh, we, we find these CVs, what's, what's interesting about them? And what, how do we follow them up? How do we get more, more data? That's a great question. So one of the most interesting things about CVs is that uh, it's extremely hard to know the age of stars. It's something that we work on uh, to try to figure out how old our Milky Way is, how old is our solar neighborhood, how old are different neighborhoods in the Milky Way. And because a cataclysmic variable has a white dwarf component, so one of the members of the binary system is already a dead star, that gives us limitations on its age because we assume that the binary system was formed together. And so even though there's still this low mass star in it, this living companion, we know the age of the white dwarf. And so this gives us in deep insight, not only into the evolution of something specific like binary systems, but just into general evolution of stars. Uh, what are we doing to continue following up on this? So uh, Josh and I actually have this exciting program up at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. There's this really awesome new telescope that has a way to view thousands of spectra in a night. And a spectrum is just viewing the brightness of a star across a range of wavelengths, giving us insight into the physics at optical wavelengths, at near infrared wavelengths at approaching UV. So we can see from blue to red across the spectrum of color, what is going on in a star. And so we're going to be following up many of these systems using that telescope. And that will tell us really interesting things um, about the chemical compositions of the accretion disk, about the sizes of various components within these binary systems. And because these systems are so rare, being able to have this insight in thousands of new systems will totally revolutionize what we know about them. Great, thank you. So I think what we should do now, uh, we've got time for uh, what I'll call a, a bit of a panel discussion, and maybe we can draw back in Rasmuth and, and Priya here. Um, in addition to Eliana. Uh, the first question uh, I think is one that um, cuts across all disciplines, which is one about education and, and mentorship in the context of data science. Um, one of the things that I'm extremely curious about is, you know, how's it going? Um, and, and what specifically are we doing at, at Berkeley in the context of teaching our students at, from the undergraduate level to the graduate level? Um, you know, the techniques that they're going to need in the future 
to lead the fields that you're all talking about. Why don't I start uh, with Rasmuth and Priya first, and then we can circle back to Ellie, who is who is a student, and, and we can get that perspective as, as well. Sure, I mean, there has been, we have our new data science uh, major at, at UC Berkeley now. So we have a course that's incredibly popular, Data Science 8, that many, many, many of our undergraduates uh, takes. And it's, uh, it's has been uh, developed in part by the statistics department. And the innovation there is that you can teach data science without teaching a lot of advanced math first. That you can really get people's hands wet with data immediately and teach data science and teach methods in data science. And it's an incredibly popular course. And they, the various courses that then built on, on that. So I think that almost no matter which field you're in, you need to learn a little bit of data science these days. And now we set up Berkeley, so we have those programs uh, now for the undergraduates uh, so they can do it. Priya, how about you? Um, the, the people that work in your lab, how are they getting the training that they need uh, to be effective um, in these, you know, advanced computational methods to do the domains. Yeah, Berkeley is just uniquely positioned to uh, teach data science and, you know, these, especially these interdisciplinary fields. We have a biology department that is really uh, strong. We have, uh, uh, we have a CS department, a computer science department that's, um, you know, uh, filled with world leaders. And now that we have this data science division that's bringing everybody together, it's really the best place to learn. Uh, we have some of such amazing classes that I have to say that I often, um, now that many of these classes are available on Zoom, I'm tuning in and trying to learn too. Uh, but students in my lab sort of are taking a range of classes and benefiting from this amazing ecosystem that we have developed here. So Ellie, uh, leading question, is this the best place to learn data science? I mean, I think so. When I chose Berkeley, I was really excited about the intersectional opportunities. And I have to say, I, I think that I chose right because I really have been given many opportunities to locate my research really at the intersection of statistics, which is the foundation for data science and astronomy. And it's been, really exciting with uh, big data nascent in the field. There's a lot of opportunity to, to do interesting things. Um, I wanna ask a, a, a different question here. In Rasmus's talk, um, there was a little hint of the messiness of the scientific method. You said something like, we couldn't come up with the models that fit the data. Um, and, and, and then it's, it sounds like you kind of went searching and found, and found the answer. Um, can you talk about the kind of modern scientific method, which is not this beautiful, you know, theory, get the, get the data, you know, and go around in a circle um, and refining the theory as the data comes in. Um, it's, it's, it's dirtier than that. Um, there's an exploratory component, but maybe you could say a bit about how data science in particular and the methods and the computations that are needed and the amount of data that we work with uh, has changed things, or at least is influencing the way that you think as a, as, a, as a scientist? Yeah, I mean, what happened was that we had really nice models and methods 20 years ago that could deal with small amounts of data and deal with it. I mean, we had mechanistic models where we could do maximum likelihood inference and Bayesian inference of parameters in those models. And then this genomic revolution happened, okay? And then none of our methods scaled up. Uh, because now the data uh, was so large. So we had to come up with other methods. And there was a sort of a mixture of bringing in uh, to, uh, you know, methods from that are already developed in other fields, old methods like you know, PCA and so, and so on, uh, various machine learning methods. And then also try to use a uh, more computationally efficient method at getting at the mechanistic models. And so I think we have the field is sort of coming back again at sort of the more mechanistic models where we again can start for large data sets to model the processes. Uh, so to model the distribution of genetic variation as a function of the history of the population more explicit, explicitly. And what that is required is that we have new graphical representations of the data. And we can then do fast, uh, algorithmically, we can do very fast computations using other forms of stochastic integration over this graphical representation, or sometimes also various forms of uh, dynamic programming algorithms that we can use. And sort of some of these new representations, graphical representations of the data has allowed us to swing back again to what we did 20 years ago and really make models 
um, mechanistic models of how populations evolve and use that to, to learn about the past history of populations. Um, Eliana, uh, quickly to you, can you give us the astronomy perspective on that question? Sure. I mean, what's interesting about astronomy is that some of, I mean, it depends when you decide astronomy started, but if you want to think of modern physics, much of class classical mechanics was actually built out of a glut of data. Kepler had observed uh, the planets in great detail, found that their orbits were ellipsoidal, was worried about this, and Newton actually used that to prove that gravity exists, that we're all orbiting the sun. And so I think in a way, astronomy is an ideal data science field because our initial understandings of the mechanics of astronomy are, are born out of data. But I do think it's really interesting to, to see, to, to be here in this moment when we really are switching gears from theory-based understandings of the universe around us to completely data-driven understandings of the universe around us. And uh, of course, data science and statistics plays a huge role in our understanding uh, and I'm excited to see how this pushes theory further in Astro. Great, thanks. There are so many other questions that are showing up in the chat, but just in the interest of um, time, um, I like to uh, I'd like to hand the floor back to Dean uh, Francis Hellman. Um, before I do that, I want to just say a, a bit about Francis. Uh, Francis is a, also a professor of physics, specifically a condensed matter experimentalist. She studies the thermodynamic properties of novel solid materials, especially thin film semiconducting, superconducting, and magnetic materials. Uh, some of you may know this already, uh, but she is also the president-elect of the American Physical Society and a member of the American uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences. I think her work is a perfect basic science story that uh, has recently led her to very interesting and unexpected and exciting directions. Because of the work that she does on amorphous, um, i.e. non-crystalline materials, she was asked to become a member of the LIGO team, which works on the next generation gravitational wave detector, which we think of as a astronomy and, and um, uh, an astrophysics project fundamentally in the objects that they're studying. But Francis' materials could actually end up as the new and improved coatings for those uh, giant mirrors in this detector. Let me hand it back to you, Francis. They're unmuted now. Thank you, Josh. And, um, uh, you know, so first thing is, thank you, Rasmus Priya Eliana, for sharing with us your work and a glimpse into the next frontiers of astronomy and biology. Um, I can't help but answer a couple of the questions that came up in the window, wearing my, in the chat window, wearing my Dean's hat just for a second, because the question was raised about the new building and whether our new data science hub might actually separate the data scientists from these, you know, these, these, these fields. And we don't think so. So, you know, you're hearing from people who've chosen to still center themselves in their disciplines and engage with data science. We think that building the new building is just going to bring data scientists together, but I don't see them as just connecting from their from their um their their departments and their and their science so I, I i i don't think i'm not at least worried about that i think i think it will just give us a new a, a hub where particularly students can have a place you know to go um and then there was one other question about scientists and non you know can can the data scientists help all the non-data scientists and i just want to shout out to um something called the Berkeley Institute for Data Science Bids, which I know was started by an astrophysicist. So there's just this long tradition of going back and forth between the sciences and the data science. And, um, and Bids, that was one of its primary goals, was, was helping non-scientists, non-data scientists learn to use data science in their field. So anyway, that just a couple of a couple of, of uh, notes that I couldn't resist answering in the chat window. Um, I love a good science talk. It's it's so important to me that our community and beyond our community can experience that same that same feel that I feel when I hear researchers describing their work. I mean, today, you know, I loved getting to hear firsthand from from these um, from these scientists what they were working on. They're exciting science stories. They show you the excellence at UC Berkeley. I, I hope it's clear to everyone. Our excellence goes really deep. It's not an accident that you're hearing from a graduate student 
researcher, students and postdocs are the future leaders. So this is just the perfect example of how important teaching and education is to research and the inverse, how important research is to teaching and education. This is really an integrated effect and, and it's what really makes Berkeley a great institution. I want to say a special thank you to our alumni and friends for gathering tonight and tonight's event is of course intended to shine a light on data science, but our series of science talks more broadly helps us to convey the importance of basic science. Basic science has always been one of Berkeley's greatest strengths. It needs to remain a strength. It just has to. It goes hand in hand with the translational and applied solutions. If we dismiss or devalue this foundational fundamental science, we're damaging the pipeline and there won't be the translational work. Um, and so it's really as simple as that. Data science is of course, particularly important. Uh, Berkeley is leading the way in terms of its use in science and as a science in and of itself. We're also leading the way in terms of educating students in its use. Your support and your advocacy for Cal means everything to us and to the faculty and the students like Rasmus, Priya and Eliana and all of the incredible students and faculty who work here. If there's anything you wanna learn more about or if you'd like to support our work, please be in touch. Uh, feel free to reach out to myself or to Joshua. We absolutely want you to be part of advancing basic science and discovery at Berkeley. Um, I, we hope to see you at our next event, which is on black holes on March 16th. And with that, fiat looks and go bears. Thank you all. <laughs>